We're live. Welcome back. This is chapter nine of biochem. This is carbohydrate metabolism, part one. Um, and the funny thing is that this is part one of our lecture on carbohydrate metabolism, but chapter nine is also called in the book carbohydrate metabolism one. So there's a carbohydrate metabolism two, which is chapter 10, I believe. And that one will also probably be split into multiple parts. So this is chapter nine, part one, and we're gonna have probably two or three parts to this lecture. And it covers the basics of carbohydrate metabolism and the goals of carbohydrate metabolism. Now, I feel like the goals are something that a lot of people glaze over when they're learning about carb metabolism. And it, it's, it's important that you don't make that mistake. It's important that you understand the reasons that carbohydrate metabolism happens, how it begins, where it begins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So before we go on to discuss the absolute atrocity that is on the board, um, let's begin by talking about why carb metabolism happens and how it happens. So when you eat, when you get hungry, it's because your body uses the things that you've eaten before and produces energy from them. And energy is used all throughout the body in order to power your bodily processes. That is basically a no-brainer, right? That we eat, we derive energy from what we eat, and then we have to eat more to replenish that energy again, right? And we store energy in the form of carbohydrates, glycogen, fats, which we've talking about already, right? Like triacylglycerols as fat, uh, as energy storage molecules, glucose, blah, blah, blah. Also, for everyone watching back home, check out the description for everything associated with the lecture. Um, thank you for sticking around. Um, but we haven't actually talked about, well, how does it all begin? So when you consume bread, right? Let's say you're eating bread. And bread is basically just a bunch of carbs, a bunch of small sugar molecules stuck together. You eat it, you chew it up, it goes to your digestive system, and then it gets absorbed in the stomach, which we talked about back in chapter nine or, chap chapter, nine or chapter eight of, no, I think it was chapter nine, of bio, which was the digestive system. We talked about how things get absorbed. You don't need to know a lot about absorption, but know that those sugars get absorbed into the bloodstream. And then in the bloodstream, we're able to deliver those sugars to different tissues. And the way that it happens is through glucose transporters, right? So glucose transporters. So what is that first molecule that's on the board? Everyone should know it by now, right? That's D-glucose. This is glucose, right? This is glucose. And the way that glucose enters cells is interesting because it's regulated by a bunch of transporters, right? And it is slightly high yield to know the different transporters and where they act. And specifically for two types of transporters. All right, number one is the GLUT2 transporter, and number two is the GLUT4 transporter. There are GLUT1, GLUT2, GLUT3, and GLUT4. We're only going to concern ourselves with GLUT2 and GLUT4. So let's talk about the GLUT2 transporter. So glucose, how does it enter cells? Let's talk about GLUT2. It is a transporter, and it's present on hepatocytes. What are hepatocytes? Hepatocytes. What does hepatic mean? Anyone? Liver. liver, right? So they're present on liver cells, right? They're present on liver cells. Liver and pancreas, right? And those are the two organs that are really sensitive to changes in blood glucose. So it makes sense that that transporter is, ex exists on the liver and the pancreas. And one more thing, one more thing, is that the GLUT2 and another enzyme that we're gonna talk about later inside the pancreas, right? those two things together signal for the release of insulin, which makes sense that when glucose is detected inside the bloodstream by the pancreas, it's going to want to release insulin. Because what does insulin do? Insulin allows for glucose uptake into cells. So one thing to know about the GLUT2 transporter, so if the GLUT2 transporter is implicated in the release of insulin, do you think it's insulin sensitive or can it work without the, the release of insulin? It's insulin independent, right? The GLUT2 transporter is insulin 
independent. Why? Because you don't want to be relying on insulin to bring glucose into the organ that produces insulin. You want it to be completely independent of that. On the contrary, the GLUT4 transporter, right? The GLUT4 transporter which is present on what? Muscle cells and adipocytes, these transporters are insulin dependent. So high blood glucose reaches the pancreas and the liver. The liver does stuff that we're going to talk about later. It's a bit more complicated in carbohydrate metabolism. but. Those are insulin independent transporters. The glucose comes into the cell without the help of insulin, right? The pancreas begins secreting insulin in response to the higher glucose concentrations. Then the insulin moves all throughout the body and activates the GLUT4 transporters, which allows glucose to move into fat cells and muscle cells, where it can be used for the formation of energy. Correct? Good. What else? So, so we didn't talk about GLUT1 and we didn't talk about GLUT3. You don't need to know much about them. But one thing we do need to talk about is the brain. Because the brain is very, very dependent on glucose. Do you think that the brain as an organ, do you think that its, insulin tr or its glucose transporters are insulin dependent or insulin independent based on what we just spoke about? Huh? Think. Think, the, if the brain always needs glucose, regardless of the energy state of the body, it's going to be independent. Regardless of whether or not insulin's circulating the body, glucose is going to the brain. It has to. It must. But I thought the brain had a lot of fat in it. It does have a lot of fat in it. Uh, it does have a lot of fat in it. It does. So the brain's going to burn through glucose, and then when you're in a low energy state, it's going to your liver begins to produce glucose from gluconeogenesis, which we're going to talk about later. But the burning of fats also produces ketone bodies, and the brain starts using ketone bodies as a source of energy as well. One more thing. Let's talk about diabetes, right? And the only things that you guys need to know about diabetes. So. Who knows the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Well, who knows someone with diabetes? Everyone, right? It's, everyone knows someone with diabetes, right? Who knows someone with type 1 diabetes? It's much more rare, right? Most people know someone with type 2 diabetes, right? So type 1 diabetes is insulin-dependent diabetes, meaning that those people are dependent on insulin to basically survive. Right? And type 1 diabetes is basically an autoimmune disease where the cells that create insulin in the pancreas get destroyed. Right? They are attacked, they get destroyed. Now, pop quiz, let's see who's been doing their Anki. What are the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin? The beta cells, the beta islet cells, yeah. So in the pancreas, we have these things called the islets of Langerhans, and the beta cells of the pancreas make insulin. Very good. The alpha cells make glucagon, and the delta cells make somatostatin. Right. So if insulin is absent, you're not getting proper activation of GLUT4. You're not getting the movement of glucose into the cells which means blood glucose remains high. What's bad about high blood glucose? Lots of things. But the biggest thing is high blood osmolarity, which can cause a bunch of different problems throughout the entire body. And classically, type 1 diabetics, when they have a diabetic crisis, they have much higher levels of glucose in their blood than type 2 diabetics. So type 1 diabetics can have levels in the 7, 8, 9 hundreds, whereas if a type 2 diabetic Oh, that's not good. Get out of there. Turn the water. 
Yeah, man. Let's learn about carbohydrate metabolism. Ugh, he's not dead. Right? She would love it, honestly. My cat. Sorry, you guys back home. I had to see that. Welcome to Broken College. Good eye, by the way. I wouldn't have caught that. Yeah. So, um, type 1 diabetics classically have very, very high blood glucose. And that's because type 2 diabetics, the receptors are the problem. The insulin receptors are becoming insensitive to insulin. So they still have insulin, and they have a little bit of receptor activity. So they're still bringing in glucose, but just not as much as a normal person would. Right? And that's usually the type of diabetes that you would see inside of someone who says, I'm a diabetic. Right? So the blood glucose remains high in both. OK. So now that we've talked about how, um, now that we've talked about how glucose gets into the cells, let's talk about what happens to glucose once it's in the cell. And the number one thing that everyone talks about when they talk about what happens to glucose is glycolysis. And glycolysis is what you see on the board right now. And I have taken the liberty of drawing out every molecule as the same way I think you should, right? Starting with glucose. This is the glycolytic pathway. And at each point, I kind of point out what um, part of the molecule has changed whenever I could, right? So what's the first thing that happens to glucose when it enters the cell? The first thing, it gets phosphorylated, right? Glucose gets phosphorylated. And that happens through an enzyme. And the name of that enzyme in a normal cell is hexokinase. HK, right? Hexokinase. Hexo meaning six carbon sugar, right? And then kinase meaning what? What does a kinase do? It phosphorylates with ATP. A kinase phosphorylate, phosphorylates using ATP. So we have ATP, and it phosphorylates, leaving us with ADP. Right. We phosphorylate that six position. Right? And if we phosphorylate the six position of glucose, this molecule is now called what? Glucose 6 phosphate. Very good. Glucose 6 phosphate. Now, in order to properly learn the steps, right? At each and every single step, we're going to ask ourselves why. All right? We're going to ask ourselves why. So why did that first step happen? Well, obviously, we have to build other stuff. And phosphorylating helps to build other molecules. And we're going to get it back, everything, blah, blah, whatever. right? We're going to get back ATP later. Because since we're using ATP here, and the goal of carbohydrate metabolism is to make ATP, this is called the investment phase. This is the investment phase of glycolysis, right? So why are we using that ATP anyways? Well, do you see how this step is irreversible? I pointed out which steps are reversible and which steps aren't, right? There's one, two, three irreversible steps right, of glycolysis. And we're going to have to study them a, a little more specially than um, we're going to need to study them a little more specially than the other steps. So we'll zoom in on them. So right now, we're zooming in on this first step, hexokinase, right? So zooming in on this step, what's the, what's the reason for hexokinase? Why does it exist? Well, if it's irreversible, the glucose is now stuck like this, right? And it can't go back. We have, what, what transporters do we have? Do we have glucose transporters or glucose 6-phosphate transporters? We have glucose transporters. Is glucose 6-phosphate the same thing as glucose? No. All right, have you guys ever read Junji Ito before? He's a horror manga artist. He's fantastic. Um, and he wrote, this, um, he wrote this manga, a very short one, called, um, uh, what was it? Um, the Legend of Amigara Fault, right? Or something like that. It's something about Amigara Fault, right? And what happens is that there's this mountain. And in the mountain, there are perfect cutouts of people. 
and people found like their, the hole that they could fit through and it, it, you fit perfectly, right? So I want you to think of the transporters as a sort of hole cut out for that molecule, right? So now that glucose has that phosphate group attached to it, it can no longer go through the transporter. So what's the point of the first step? This glucose is now trapped in the cell. It cannot leave. It has to go through the rest of glycolysis. It can't leave. It can't get out. It can't go back. It's not going anywhere else. Whatever cell it's in, it gets phosphorylated. It's trapped. It has to be used. All right? So that's the point of the first step. And you know what we're going to do? For the first time ever, we're going to use the second board. So step one. Hexokinase traps glucose in the cell as glucose 6 phosphate. Hexokinase traps glucose in the cell as glucose 6 phosphate. All right, the next step is reversible. And it's basically just the aldehyde and this oxygen swapping places. You can see that. What a scary sight to walk into. Huh? You did? Please create carbonyl, right? <laughs> What is it, like uh, phos, it's like a phosphate chlorochromate something, like, oh sorry, no, it's pyridinium chlorochromate or something like that, I, I don't know, pyridinium something. There's a cockroach climbing on the, on the little top banner, it's dead, yeah, it's dead. Kiro pointed out, yeah, what's up? It doesn't. There's a carbon there. Yeah, it's not a carboxylic acid. There's a carbon. So that aldehyde and that OH swap places, right? They swap places. And if they swap places, like we said before, right? We said this last time when we were talking about the structure of carbohydrates. What is the sugar that's made if you take glucose and you isomerize it? What's that sugar? Anyone know? Fructose. Fructose, right? So this is fructose, but it's fructose with a phosphate on the 6 position, so it's fructose 6 phosphate. Anyone know the name of the enzyme? It is a type of isomerase, a little more specific. It has two names, it has three names actually, but two that are more commonly stated, right? This enzyme is called phosphoglucose isomerase. Phosphoglucose isomerase, right? or phosphoglucoisomerase, or glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. I like phosphoglucose isomerase. Doesn't require any energy, just does the transition, right? OK. So we. You weren't here, but we started using the board behind this to describe each step of glycolysis. We're going to wait until we get here to describe these three steps. OK? So we're going to wait till we're here. So what's the next step? Well, we go from fructose 6-phosphate to what? We put another phosphate on it, right? This is a very famous compound. What's it called? 
fructose. Still fructose, right? This is fructose one six bisphosphate. I don't know why it's called bis. It just is. Bisphosphate. I guess it's none of my business. You know what? I don't need this right now. Um, could someone do me a favor? Yeah. Just go plug in my laptop over there so I can use it later. Thank you. Hello, dead cockroach. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And what is the enzyme called? This is the most important enzyme in all of glycolysis. Repeat after me. Phospho, fructo, kinase, one. PFK1. Phospho, fructo, kinase, one. PFK1. And if it's called PFK1, what do you think is the other enzyme we're going to learn about? PFK. Two. <laughs> PFK2. PFK1 and PFK2. And if it's a kinase, what does it need? ATP. Because kinases phosphorylate using ATP. We're going to put a star here because this is the rate limiting step of glycolysis. Can't go back. Just can't go back. The irreversible processes are very tightly regulated. So these are points of regulation, basically. This next one looks real complicated, but it's not that complicated. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, or F1,6-BP, right? Because you could, should get used to abbreviating these as well, splits into two different sugars. You take a six-carbon sugar, and you split it into two three-carbon sugars. And you do it using a retroaldol reaction, right? So right here, do you see, hold on, everyone look at the board real quick. You see a ketone, right? And then alpha beta to the ketone is an OH. A beta hydroxy ketone or aldehyde is a product of an aldol reaction, right? So in order to break a beta hydroxy ketone, we can use a retroaldol reaction. So the enzyme is appropriately labeled Aldolase. Break the aldol. Aldolase. Aldolase. And since we broke a hexose, we made two trioses. And these are the most simple sugars we have, just with phosphates attached. That's dihydroxyacetone, and this is glyceraldehyde. That's dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This is glyceraldehyde phosphate. So this is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP. And this is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, but we just call it GAP. But in your notes, I would write down the full name. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Like why they call it acetone, I hate it. Yeah, it sucks, right? Because yeah. you don't leave acetone like a sugar. Yeah. But tack two, tack two hydroxides on it, now it's a sugar. Will acetone kill you? 
If you drink enough of it, yeah, but a little bit probably won't. So, but I'm not, say, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying to drink acetone. I have not drank acetone. But your body produces acetone in really small amounts. <laughs> I like the smell of acetone. The acetone smells really good. I love the smell of acetone. I love the smell of Sharpies. I love the smell of gasoline. What is that? Toluene? Oh, toluene. I don't think, I don't remember what toluene smells like. Hexane smells really nice. Hexane smells really nice. Yeah. And I remember benzene smelling sweet. Yeah. Benzene so, smells sweet. <laughs> Diethyl ether smells good too. All the volatile liquids. So gap and dehap, right. And you see only gap moves forward. Dehap kind of gets left behind, right? Because it can go do other things. But one of the things it can do is turn into gap, right? And that's an isomerization as well. And if these are trioses and they have phosphates on them and we're isomerizing them, the name of the enzyme is triose phosphate isomerase. Wait, I didn't write this one in blue. This is aldolase and triose phosphate isomerase, or TPI, to isomerize between DHAP and GAP. OK. So now. Let's explain what's going on. Well, in order to do this, right, in order to do this, to cre create two activated sugars, right, because what do we mean by activated? They have phosphates on them. Do you see how these two activated sugars came from the fructose? And that came from the fact that we made fructose here? Because without making the fructose, we wouldn't have been able to phosphorylate that one position. Because the one position on glucose is taken already. And we wouldn't be able to break it like we did, because we wouldn't have the proper beta hydroxide, blah, 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 whatever. So the whole point of converting glucose into fructose is to prepare for a later cleavage, right? To later cleave the molecule. So step two, step two is when we use Phosphoglucose isomerase, or PGI, to turn G6P into F6P, preparing for future cleavage. That's step two. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I would write these on a separate sheet of paper. Yeah. What's step three? The rate limiting enzyme glycolysis. PFK1 phosphorylates. the one position of fructose 6-phosphate, making fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It is rate limiting. And there's also tight control of this enzymatic process, which we're going to talk about later. Step four. Aldolase breaks fructose 1,6 bisphosphate into DHAP and GAP. Step five. 
step five. And step five is like a quasi step. It's not like really a step, but it is. Triose phosphate isomerase turns dHAP into another molecule of GAP. These five steps together are coined the investment phase of glycolysis. Why is it called the investment phase? Because we put in two ATP. We paid two ATP to get stuff going. And if the goal of carbohydrate metabolism is to make ATP, we have to get some back. So if there's an investment, there's probably a payoff. And the rest of the steps of glycolysis are known as the payoff phase. The payoff phase. Phosphorylates the one position. The one position. Good there. So those are the five investment phase steps of glycolysis. Can I erase the board? Oh, hold on. Those are the five investment phase steps of glycolysis. So now we're going to fuck. <laughs> Now we're going to enter the payoff phase. Is that centered on the camera? Yeah, we'll fix it, yeah. Beautiful. Now we're going to enter the payoff phase. The payoff phase begins with my favorite reaction, my favorite two reactions in all of glycolysis, because explaining them is a lot of fun. And you guys see how the investment phase is up top and then the payoff phase is on the bottom? Yeah, see how I did that? Right. All right. We take glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and we turn it into this molecule. It has one phosphate and a three phosphate, so that it is a bisphosphate molecule, right? And it's glycerate, right? It's a derivative of glycerate, not glyceraldehyde, glycerate. So this is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. also known as 1,3-BPG. You guys have probably heard of that compound before. 1,3-BPG. There's someone looking in the room. <laughs> Hello. Huh? I, I can't hear you from all the way down here. Oh, oh, okay. We're teaching an MCAT course. Yeah. So 1,3-BPG. Huh? Use the girl from the very first book where they explain algae. Oh. Bro, I don't remember. 1,3-BPG. <laughs> right? Well, what's another BPG molecule that we've heard about before? Do you guys, who's been doing their Anki? Me. You? Yeah. What does it do? Very good. That's one smart cookie. 2,3-BPG decreases the um, affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen in the adult form. And if you've been doing the Anki, you would know that fetal hemoglobin does not accommodate 2,3-BPG. So fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. Very good. 
one three B P G, right? And this, I can't write the full name of the enzyme, so you have to write it down by me dictating it to you. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase, also known as GAPDH. Gap DH. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase. Now, this is the first step where our buddy comes into play. Who knows who our buddy is? Anyone know what is required for this step? Well, we obviously need a phosphate, but it's not from an, a kinase, so it's not ATP. So the phosphate's inorganic, right? It's an inorganic phosphate. But you also know that we're turning an aldehyde into a derivative of a carboxylic acid, so we're oxidizing. What do we use to do oxidations in the body? We're oxidizing. What do we, what do we use to do oxidations? We use NAD and an inorganic phosphate. And that will give us NADH and H plus. Where's that NADH going to go? To the electron transport chain. Have you guys gotten to those Anki cards yet? How many ATP produced per NADH molecule? Huh? Is it, in it is in biochem, I think. We'll get there. We'll get there. How many ATPs, what? How many ATPs are produced per NAD molecule? Uh, sorry, per NADH molecule. <laughs> Thirty-six is per glucose molecule. <laughs> Two point five. Two point five. Very good. I didn't forget this time. 2.5. Do you know how much for FADH2? 1.5. We'll go over why when we go over the electron transport chain. So we do this, right? And you guys can see that actually this loops back on another thing we were talking about. So we have a we have a R C. O, R, C, O, O, and then this. That's a mixed anhydride. So we go from an aldehyde to an anhydride, right? And if you remember the list of the carboxylic acid derivatives, the aldehyde is below the anhydride. So the anhydride is actually higher energy, right? That's going to come into handy in a second. Because what happens here? What happens here? Here, it releases that phosphate that we just gave it. So we give glyceraldehyde a phosphate and turn it into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and then it just gives it up immediately. Imagine me giving you 20 bucks and you being like, nah, take it back. Right? Why? Why did that happen? We have to talk about why that happened. So what's the name of this enzyme? This is, well, first let's name this. If that's at 1, 3 BPG, we got rid of the 1. So now it's just 3 PG, 3 phosphoglycerate. Three phosphoglycerate. So now it's just 3 PG, right? 3 PG. Some enzymes in glycolysis are named after the reverse reaction, and this is one of them, right? This enzyme is phosphoglycerate kinase. Or PGK. Phosphoglycerate kinase, PGK. I know it's so hard to read that, but I really can't write any bigger with all this. I would rather draw the molecules bigger than the enzyme names because I can tell you them. Phosphoglycerate kinase, PGK. Did 
dude, I can't imagine being in this lecture without having taken biochem. I would just kill myself. It's actually really good. <laughs> I would actually just kill myself. <laughs> I would have no patience. Oh, I'm not supposed to say it on camera. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> right? Right? And so that when you get two biochem, you can just put your dick in everyone's mouth. Like, you're gonna, you're just gonna be top. You're just gonna be top of the class. Huh? Fuck them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I love you guys. Just know that. Okay. Yo. Order in the court. Phosphoglycerate kinase. I just told you that it's named after the reverse reaction, right? And a kinase uses ATP. So you can see if we went backwards, which we can here, we would use ATP to phosphorylate that one position, right? So the forward reaction actually takes ADP and gives us back ATP. Now this is the beginning of the payoff. This is the beginning of the payoff. Right. So, quick question. Quick question. Let's use the other board. <laughs> Let's zoom in on those two steps. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw them. Well, I'll draw them the way I'd normally draw them. So you guys put your pens down, everyone. Just, just look at the board for a second. So we saw 1,3-BPG coming from Three PG, and then turning into, or sorry, gap, and then turning into three PG, right? We gave him the phosphate, and he gave it away. Why did that happen? Well, I want you to zoom in real quick into the very depths of my brain, and recall this. Chem 2, yeah, basically. All right. This step is going to be the black step, and this step is going to be the purple step. That's not purple, is it? It is, right? I can't tell the difference between those two colors. <laughs> OK, so we know that this step uses NAD and a phosphate group to make NADH, NH+. And we know that this step takes ADP and turns it into ATP. When you turn ADP into, hey, when you turn ADP into ATP, what sort of a bond are you making? You're making a phosphor and hydride bond, right? Because what, it, what does that bond look like? It looks like uh, P, O, O, double bond, O, O, P, O, 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 R. That's the bond between phosphates and ATP. Are you sick? Oh, yeah. eh. All right, good. Well, my roommate has COVID. I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> um, so that, he's not living with us. <laughs> um, that, right? Phos mix, uh, mix and hydride. Phosphor and hydride bond, right? That's the bond we're making. So we have to make, in, remember, when we make ATP, we're making an anhydride bond, right? And when we break ATP, we're breaking that anhydride bond and basically making a carboxylate, which is all the way down here, right? That's why it releases so much energy. You go from here all the way down here. You're crashing down the levels, right? So take a look. Take a look at this step, these two steps. Over here. We're taking an aldehyde and turning it into what? What did I say this was? What did I say this was? It's a mixed anhydride. So it's an anhydride, right? So we're taking an aldehyde in the black step, and we're turning it into a anhydride. That shouldn't really be possible unless we're putting in energy. But we're not putting in energy. 
We're actually deriving energy out of that. So why is that happening? Do you guys remember when I told you that certain reactions can happen because they're coupled with other reactions? Immediately after, immediately after climbing that ladder, what do you do? You take the really energetic compound and you crash it all the way back down. So the net result is a loss of this much energy to the environment. And where does this energy go? It goes into the formation of ATP. It's a coupled reaction that forms ATP. So do you guys now see how we sacrifice a little bit of energy, we give in a little bit of energy, we make things more unstable, we make things more unstable in order to crash all the way down the stability ladder and release enough energy to form ATP. That is the beginning of the payoff phase of glycolysis. And this, you should write this down or take a picture of it, because this is your explanation for step six and seven. Do you guys get it? Yeah, what's up? So for like step seven, mm -hmm. the previous time it happened, it flew in step six? Like, how does that? Work? What do you mean? So, so, no, no, no. So, what's happening is that the transformation of the aldehyde into the anhydride allows for the anhydride to then be turned into carboxylate that releases enough energy to turn, a, to turn ADP into ATP. Because the thing is, the thing is, if you simply went from the aldehyde to the carboxylate, you wouldn't have produced enough energy to form ATP. By climbing the ladder and then crashing down, you're forming the ATP. Basically, let's say I really, really wanted to shatter my fucking ankle, right? If I climb up on this table, right, and I jump off, it won't be enough to break my ankle. But if I climb the top of James Hall and jump off, not only am I shattering my ankle, you guys won't have a lecturer anymore, right? So we climb the ladder to get enough energy to fall back down. Think of this like a potential energy ladder. Yeah. Uh, it's fine. It's like it, this today it's fine because my jeans are a bit too loose on me. I've lost a bit of weight, so it doesn't stay tucked into my jeans. So I'm just like letting it hang out below my hoodie. Yeah, right? No, because it's like, it's like I'm just like trendy. You know, I'm like layering. Right? I'm cool and trend. Oh, I'll t tell you a really funny story about being trendy. It was my first day shadowing ortho. First day. It was like July. And I was called in at 9 in the morning. I was getting ready. And my mom told me to take out the trash right before I left. So I'm in shirt and tie, dress pants, everything. Like, I look proper the part. Because Dr. Naziri really, like, enforced. He's like, show up, shirt and tie. Like, that's, that's what he wanted. So my mom told me to go take out the trash, right? So I take out the trash. And I come back in the house, and I'm like, okay, bye, mom, I'm going to leave, blah, 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 whatever. Start driving. I realize I'm still wearing my sneakers that I wore to take out the trash. So that whole day, I'm in ortho clinic in a shirt and tie, dress pants, and skateboard shoes. Very trendy. Very, trendy. very, very trendy. Did he notice? Oh, of course he noticed. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> the first thing he did when I walked in is look me up and down. <laughs> This is, this, is the sa this is the same guy who was walking around the ortho clinic in $600 Salvatore Ferragamo shoes. Like, he, he's a trendy guy. He's really cool. If you guys ever want to work ortho at Downstate, go hit up Dr. Naziri. He's a fantastic attending. All right. So do you guys get this? Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? Because if you get this, you're going to understand, like, all of biochem. Like, biochem is just a bunch of this. That's, that's it. So, and remember, it's named after the reverse reaction, phosphoglycerate kinase. Okay. What's next? We take the phosphate group and we swap the OH and the phosphate. It's called mutating the molecule, right? So this is called phosphoglycerate mutase, right? Phosphoglycerate mutase, PGM. I'm going to write it out for you. It's Phosphoglycerate 
mutase. Look, my R is not attached to my E. <laughs> Phosphoglycerate mutase. That's a reversible process as well. Right? Now, that's step eight. Why did step eight happen? You guys can write it down. I'm not going to swap the board again. Step eight just prepares us for step nine. That's it. It puts the phosphate in the correct position for step nine. Because in step nine, oh, oops, I didn't name the molecule. If that's 3PG, this is just 2PG, 2-phosphoglycerate. Because in step nine, we're basically taking this. That's a primary alcohol, right? We're doing a dehydration of a primary alcohol, right? So that forms a double bond right here. My orgo people, you should know that really well. Dehydration of a primary alcohol. So we make the double bond going that way. So now, look, do you guys see how if this were an OH right here, that'd be an enol, right? An enol. And what is this? This is pyruvate. So that would be the enol of pyruvate if that were an OH. So this is phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP. This is phosphoenol pyruvate. Phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP. And that reaction, hmm? no, it does not. This one. That one does. This one doesn't. I always like forget the name of this enzyme for a second, and then I remember it. Because you're making an enol. It's called enolase. That's step nine. So what does step nine do? For your list, I'm not going to swap the board again. Step nine basically right, prepares for the ketoenol tautomerism and ATP synthesis that will take place to form pyruvate. So step nine prepares for the ketoenol tautomerism and ATP synthesis that will produce pyruvate. So I just gave it away that this is pyruvate, right? That's pyruvate. And if that's pyruvate, and I told you also, I gave another thing away, that it produces ATP. What's the name of that enzyme, anyone? No. What's the name of that enzyme? The last enzyme in glycolysis. It's an, it's, uh, it is a irreversible enzyme that is named after the reverse reaction. It's really stupid. Pyruvate kinase. PK. Anyone watch PK, the Bollywood movie? It's a good movie. And that's step 10. And that's just the formation of pyruvate. That is glycolysis. Take your photos, do a little dance, cry, you know. Gain, f gain 15 pounds in your basement while you're studying for the MCAT. I gained 15 pounds studying for the MCAT. You don't? I didn't, I didn't either until I studied for the MCAT. 
I gained 15 pounds studying for the MCAT, and then I got absolutely fucking shredded before medical school. And then I hit medical school, and then I lost all my gains. But now I look like I, now I look like normal again. So, like I usually do. So. I was in BAMD. Yeah. I don't really go around advertising it, but I was in BAMD. Because like, because like. Yeah, but if you develop that mentality, it's gonna follow you around for the rest of your life. Like if I if I if I if I was like, oh, I'm in a direct pl program, let me just become complacent. Like, I probably wouldn't have done well on the MCAT, <laughs> because I will tell you, the the T about BAMD is that people who are like that, people who are like, oh, like now I can relax, they don't do well, they they don't fare off very well, and I'll tell you that as someone who's in medical school, with them. So that's glycolysis, right? And the last thing, we know we made ATP again, but I've explained this before, right? That the energy for the ATP comes from, so here you're not really, it's not really a carboxylic acid derivative here, it's just a phosphate on an OH group, but breaking that gives you a bit of energy. The rest of the energy to form that anhydride bond comes from the ketone tautomerism because the ketone is favored. And since we form the ketone, it releases energy, and that goes into the formation of ATP. And that's glycolysis. Let's talk about that. So that's glycolysis. Now, we're going to zoom in on the specifics of glycolysis. So this is glycolysis. And for everyone back home and everyone here, I want you to take this, wherever you have it, and just either flip back and forth to it or take a screenshot of this or on your phone or like do something and put it to the side because we're going to be referencing this a lot as we continue to talk about specifics of glycolysis. Okay, so if any of you guys want to take a photo of this while you're taking notes, please go ahead. And I'm going to grab my laptop because now I need it. Sorry? The number of times that this exact thing has been written on a sheet of paper in front of me while studying is fucking unbelievable. It definitely exceeds 100. I've definitely written this over 100 times. Yeah. Yeah. OK. This? Just why, right? Just why? You're not on camera, so um, I, I feel comfortable asking this question. Who here believes in God? Go ask God why. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's zoom in. So number one, let's talk about this idea of investment and payoff. Right? Let's talk about investment and payoff. So I told you that those first five steps of glycolysis are considered the investment phase because we invest two ATP into it, right? Steps one through five, we invest two ATP. Where do we invest ATP? It helps to know. ATP investment happens at the hexokinase step and also happens at the step of PFK1, which we know is the rate-limiting step of glycolysis. I'm going to say it over and over and over again. Those are two points where ATP gets consumed in order to prepare glycolysis and prepare the, the sugars that are needed in order to go into the payoff phase. The payoff phase doesn't look like a payoff phase. Because look, we gave in 2 ATP, we get 1, 2 ATP back, right? So what are the two where we get it back? So here's the investment, and here's the formation. What are the two steps where we get it back? Number one is phosphoglycerate kinase. And number two is pyruvate kinase. I would also get used to calling the steps by the enzymes that do them. So look, it's two and two. Where's the payoff? Where's the payoff? No. We, right now, so look, this is, this is what? Minus two ATP. This is plus two ATP. This is just net zero. 
Where's the payoff? It's not the NADH. It's not downstream. They tell you that glycolysis is a net increase in energy. How? You guys are missing something. Look, those two ATP, I guess I got to bring this back. Oh, I erased it. Am I centered? Yeah. Those two ATP come from what? Gap goes forward, goes forward, gives you back. Goes forward, goes forward, goes forward, gives you back. Once gap is done and turned into pyruvate, DHAP comes in and does the whole thing over again. You get it twice. You get two ATP for every three carbon sugar you make. And how many three carbon sugars did you make? Two. So what happens? Times two gives you four, which means you net two ATP. Glycolysis is a net gain of two ATP for every single molecule. Glycolysis alone. For NADH. When NADH goes to the electron transport chain, it gives you 2.5 ATP. What else do you get? You, so you net 2 ATP and you net one NADH molecule. Those are the products of glycolysis. Oh, and 2 pyruvate. Nope, DHAP turns into GAP and then just moves forward. Remember, triose phosphate isomerase. So once GAP is done, triose phosphate isomerase turns DHAP into GAP and then it moves forward again. All right. Damn. Good catch. Two. Because you get one for every three carbon sugar. Yeah? So glycolysis nets you two ATP, two NADH, and two pyruvates, right? And we just said that the investment phase loses you two ATP, and every three carbon molecule that goes through grants you two ATP, but there's two of them. So it grants you four in the payoff, which means net two, right? Let's talk about specific enzymes of glycolysis. I already told you that hexokinase, its job is to trap glucose inside the cell because glucose 6-phosphate can't get out. Glucose can, right? There's another form of hexokinase found within the body. It is known as glucokinase. Glucokinase. And it is an enzyme that makes glucose 6-phosphate. It's the same thing as hexokinase, but it has a very high Km. It has a very high Km. Whereas hexokinase has a very low Km. What's good, low KM or high KM? Low KM is good, right? Which means it gets, you need a lot of glucose to get this guy kicking, right? Glucokinase is found in the pancreas. And I believe the liver. Let me check. I believe the liver, it's not in my notes, but I think it's also in the liver. Yes, liver and pancreas. So notice that glucokinase exists in the same places that the GLUT2 transporter exists, the insulin-independent transporter, right? And if it's found in the pancreas and the liver, glucokinase activity basically just tells you that there's high glucose in the body. 
and it basically acts as a glucose sensor. That's what this enzyme is. This enzyme is a glucose sensor. And better yet, it's never inhibited. Nothing inhibits this enzyme from doing its job. Whereas hexokinase is inhibited by glucose 6 phosphate. What type of inhibition is that? Anyone? Feedback. Yeah, it's feedback inhibition. All right. This is going to be the most difficult discussion that we have in this lecture. Probably all. This is probably the most difficult concept to grasp um, in this lecture, so in general. PFK1 and his brother, PFK2. They're both men because only men can make you cry this much. It's a good one, right? You'd be fucking dying. <laughs> PFK1. What does it do? It turns fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, right? It is the rate-limiting step glycolysis. And it is inhibited by ATP. So what I'm going to do, actually, you know what? Let's do this. I've found a better way of doing things. And I suggest you do it this way, too. I'm going to put the ATP up here. And I'm going to put PFK1 down here so we can talk about it. What does that make? It makes the 1 6 bisphosphate. PFK1 is inhibited by certain things and activated by certain things. It is inhibited by ATP and citrate. ATP makes sense, right? Because when you have a lot of ATP in the body, you don't really need to do glycolysis. So you're going to shut down the rate-limiting step of glycolysis. Why does the citrate make sense? Yeah, so, but what, how is citrate formed? Does anyone know? Anyone know what two things come together to form citrate? Acetyl-CoA and? Acetyl-CoA and what else? Temptation. No. Because pyruvate turns into acetyl-CoA, right? You know who knows? I know. Oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA come together to form citrate. So if there's high citrate, that means there was high pyruvate because citrate comes from acetyl-CoA. Sorry, let me say that the other way around. If there's high citrate, there was high acetyl-CoA, which means there was a lot of pyruvate. And if there's a lot of pyruvate, we've already done a lot of glycolysis. So we can shut it down.
It is activated by two things. AMP, indicating a very low level of energy in the body, and fructose, 2, 6, is phosphate. Sorry, I should write these down here. Why are we using fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate? Well, if PFK1 makes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, PFK2 makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, right? Everyone, put your pens down and look at the board. In your body, specifically in your liver, there is a bifunctional enzyme a bifunctional enzyme, and a lot of biochemists just call it bifunctional enzyme. This bifunctional enzyme looks like this. There's one domain connected to another domain. Ask God, okay? The two domains do completely opposite things. One of them is PFK2. And the other one is FBPACE2. What does FBPACE2 mean, right? We're going to learn about fructose bisphosphatase 1, right, which is going to take the 1 phosphate and break it and turn it back into this, right? And you're confused now because you're like, hey, I thought this uh, reaction wasn't reversible. It's not. We're using a different enzyme. We're using a completely different enzyme. So FBPase 1 takes this and goes back there. So FBPase 2 turns fructose 2,6-bisphosphate back into fructose 6-phosphate. PFK2 takes fructose 6-phosphate and turns it into this. It turns it into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, right? So... Here's the thing, fructose 6-phosphate, actually it's not reversible, so there's this and then there's this, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. This is PFK2 and this is FBPase2. And those exist on the same molecule as a bifunctional enzyme, okay? The whole point here is to tightly regulate the amount of this. Because fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a very heavy activator of PFK1. And if it's an activator of PFK1, it's an activator of glycolysis. So this bifunctional enzyme regulates the rate of glycolysis very tightly. And you know what activates the enzyme? insulin. That's the difficult discussion. Copy that down. Sec.
Guess who it is? It's my dad this time. <laughs> okay. So, do you guys understand that? Do you guys understand how it's a little tricky, right? There's one more step that's a little tricky about this. When FBPH2 is activated, there's more gluconeogenesis going on. When PFK2 is activated, there's more glycolysis going on. So this guy is basically just a seesaw between breaking glucose and making glucose. When PFK2 is activated, more glycolysis is going on. When FBPH2 is active, more gluconeogenesis is going on. And the way this works is through phosphorylating a domain of the enzyme. And phosphorylating a certain domain activates one of the two enzymes. I forgot which one's which. Like when it's phosphorylated, one of them's active. When it's dephosphorylated, another one of them's active. I forget which one's which. But you don't really need to know the specifics of that. I might have like zoned out during that lecture during Professor Malitsky's class. <laughs> Rookie mistake, right? You guys get this? Yeah? PFK2, or sorry, F226BP, fructose 26 is phosphate, very, very, very heavy activator of glycolysis. So, PFK2 is activated by insulin, like we said, right? F26BP is the product, it upregulates PFK1, and it is inhibited, if it's activated by insulin, it's inhibited by glucagon. Fructose 26 bisphosphate allows for upregulation of PFK1 even when there's a lot of ATP in the cell. So even when there's a lot of ATP and it's trying to inhibit PFK1, the activation by fructose 26 bisphosphate overrides that. And how does that get formed from PFK2, which comes from high insulin, which comes all the way back from the pancreatic beta islet cells detecting high glucose from the GLU2 transporter. That's why we talked about that back in the beginning. So let's look at the whole pathway. You eat a high carb meal. Glucose gets in the digestive system, gets broken down, right? Amylases and all, those, all that stuff, right? Breaks down into simple sugars. Simple sugars get absorbed in the blood. Goes to the liver and the pancreas. The pancreas detects the increases in glucose because there's an insulin-independent glucose transporter, the GLUT2 transporter, that brings glucose into the beta islet cells of the pancreas. They begin to express insulin. The insulin goes into the bloodstream. It hits the liver. The insulin activates PFK2. PFK2 makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is sent all the way around the body to activate PFK1. And PFK1 upregulates glycolysis. So that's the whole pathway of how the ingestion of glucose upregulates glycolysis. I should type that out for you guys. I should you know what we should do? You know what I should do? I should put a document in, the, uh, in our little Google Drive folder of like just written out like pathways, like bullet point pathways. That'd be cool. I might do that. All right, we good? Cool, next enzyme. Oh, by the way, that's as tough as the science gets. That's it, knowing that like 10 step process, that's as hard as it gets. Huh? That's very hard. Yeah, it is. But there's probably nothing more difficult than that that you would need to learn. Unless, unless you want to get really specific about how the electron transport chain works, which we will. I should write a book. Professor, Professor Malitsky should write a book. I'm just telling you what he told me. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. In the autobiography, biography, right? Okay. GAP-DH, um, the big thing to know about that is just that it 
forms NADH, and that NADH is going to go to the electron transport chain and help to increase the energy charge of the cell, right? What do we mean by the energy charge of the cell? Well, there are certain ratios that we have to know about. And I can finally have the discussion with you guys. All right. So there is an ATP to ADP ratio that exists in the cell. And there is an NADH to NAD ratio that exists in the cell. ATP indicates high energy. ADP indicates low energy. NADH indicates high energy. NAD plus indicates low energy, right? So there's a constant push and pull between these, right? And whenever one of them gets greater than the other, they start to activate stuff all over the place, right? So when the ATP gets too high, it downregulates glycolysis. When the ADP gets too high, it starts to upregulate glycolysis. Same thing with the NADH and the NAD plus. Now, there's a sneaky, the sneaky third ratio that exists. You guys ready? What's the difference? Do any of you know the difference? Does I would don't even question the amount I'd start crying, oh, tears of joy, if any of you guys knew this. He knows it. He knows the answer to the question. He knows. <laughs> there you go, buddy. NADH and NAD plus are implicated in glycolytic pathways. So glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, ETC. Whereas the NADPH and NADP plus ratio is implicated in DNA synthesis, or more specifically, nucleotide synthesis. I am so happy. I, I am very happy right now. First you and now him. You guys are actually like better than I am. You guys are doing good. Uh, you guys need to do great. Don't even worry about it. OK. These two ratios, right? Do you guys remember the discussion we had all the way at the beginning that glucose 6-phosphate isn't glucose? NADP is not NAD, right? So since. NADP is not NAD, and NADPH is not NADH. They are two completely separate entities, which means that these are two completely separate ratios that don't influence one another. And since the increase or decrease in either of these activates or deactivates these pathways, we regulate energy differently than DNA synthesis. So DNA synthesis and cell growth can occur whether energy is low or high. Very good. You get two Jolly Ranchers. Whoa. That's a first. Handed. Handed. Yeah. Handed to him. <laughs> Do you guys get the distinction? You guys understand what I'm getting at, right? That these are two different ratios of two different things that regulate two completely separate systems that work independently of one another. So even, even if you had an overwhelming amount of glucose that was driving your NADH super high up, DNA synthesis would not stop or slow down or speed up or anything. It would continue the way it is. We'll talk more about this when we talk about glutathione and DNA synthesis. I've been hyping up that small talk for a while now. <laughs> OK, OK. Pyruvate kinase. Ah, one thing about pyruvate kinase. Write this down. It is activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is the product of PFK1. It's feed forward regulation. feed forward activation, to be specific. Pyruvate kinase is activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It's 
So let's go back to our board. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate feeds forward to activate the last step of glycolysis. Formation of that activates that. All right. Good? Yes? One more thing about glycolysis, and then we're going to move forward. What time is it, by the way? 7.47. It's about how long I thought it would take. Um, whenever you make ATP that is not in the electron transport chain, like the ATPs we made, phosphoglycerate kinase and pyruvate kinase, that's called substrate level phosphorylation, not oxidative phosphorylation. That's called substrate level phosphorylation. All right. Let's say I'm a runner, right? I am. Anyone else do any other sports here? Soccer, swimming, biking, anyone? Sports? Call them out. Tennis? Tennis. Badminton? Badminton. 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 Swimming? Basketball. Basketball? Swimming? Yeah? If I told you to swim four laps, as quickly as you possibly can, as, as quickly as you possibly can, you're gonna come out of the water and your muscles are gonna be sore and you're gonna be breathing very heavily because there's an increase in oxygen demand because of increased energy demands. And in some of your cells, there's gonna be a low oxygen environment Right? And that low oxygen environment actually turns off some of the pathways that are downstream from glycolysis. Right? Specifically, the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. Right? Because you need oxygen for the electron transport chain to occur. And if the electron transport chain doesn't occur, you get a buildup of NADH. And that high NADH to NAD plus ratio indicates a high energy status, even though. You don't have that much energy, right? And what's going to happen is that that NADH, A, has to leach out somewhere, and B, you're going to get an accumulation of acetyl-CoA. Because what happens right after glycolysis? So right after glycolysis, this is pyruvate, right? And there's pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is a complex, right? which actually makes ATP as well, and NADH. And that complex, oh, it also forms CO2. And that complex forms acetyl-CoA. So you put in ADP, an inorganic phosphate, NAD+, and coenzyme A, CoASH, and you get out ATP, NADH, CO2, and acetyl-CoA. When the TCA cycle is inhibited because there's not enough oxygen, right, you get a buildup of that, which decreases the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which means that pyruvate needs to find another way out. What's that other way out? So this is aerobic respiration. We can go anaerobic respiration, right? We can go anaerobic. And going the anaerobic pathway involves, remember I said that the NADH gets really high and has to leach out somewhere because it's not using the electron transport chain? The NADH starts to leach this way. Do you guys remember that I said that NAD is responsible for heterooxidations and FAD is responsible for homooxidations, right? So what is so NADH does heteroreductions. 
What is the hetero reduction we're going to do here? It is the reduction of the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen right here. Right? So if we reduce that, we're going to turn pyruvate into this thing, which all my athletes should know very well. That is lactate. Lactate. And that's what's going to cause your muscles to be sore. Lactate. One more thing. The formation of lactate actually gives us back NAD+. And that NAD+, can then go back to glycolysis, perform the glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase reaction, and push forward the payoff phase of glycolysis. So the whole reason for forming lactate from pyruvate is to get back NAD+, so we can continue to leach off the two ATP we get from glycolysis. Plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two. Plus two. Right? And you're like, but Yusuf, that doesn't make sense. We only get one NAD per pyruvate out of this. We need two NAD for glycolysis to pay, off, pay us off plus two. Well, you got two pyruvates. So that happens twice. So you get two NADH, two, two NAD feeding back into glycolysis, giving you two of the cycle, giving you back plus two ATP every single time it happens. So that's where we derive our energy from when we are low in oxygen, right? And that makes sense. It's a lot more inefficient, but it's a way of getting energy even without oxygen, with low oxygen in our body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So I wrote in my notes, freeze up NAD plus for gap DH. Sarah, you're going to help me out with this part of the lecture, OK? We're going to talk about glycolysis in erythrocytes. Do, do red blood cells have mitochondria? No. no, why not? Never get high on your own supply. Don't puff your own weed, all right? So we got red blood cells. I don't have a red marker. We got red blood cells that are carrying a fuck ton of oxygen, right? And if they had mitochondria, that oxygen would receive electrons and protons from the electron transport chain and be turned into H2O. And then we'd be dead. Because the oxygen would not reach our muscle cells and everything else that needs it. We would die. Our red blood cells would just be like, huzzah. Oxygen, amazing, right? So they don't have mitochondria. Which means that they can only do up to glycolysis. Because where does glycolysis occur? It occurs in the cytoplasm. But the Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondria. The ETC occurs in the mitochondria. Fatty acid breakdown occurs in the mitochondria. Sorry. Fatty acid synthesis occurs in the mitochondria, I believe. I had to check that. Which one occurs in the mitochondria again? I think, I think it's synthesis, right? Let me check. Hold on. Sorry, synthesis in the cytoplasm break down the mitochondria. That makes sense. That makes sense because the the NADH and NAD the NADH you form from fatty acid synthesis has to go to the electron transport chain or break down. So when you break down fatty acids, they're going to form NADH and FADH two, and that's going to go to the ETC, which is why it happens inside the mitochondria. Okay, what are we talking about? This is a red blood cell, right? Red blood cells carry a lot of oxygen. They lack mitochondria for that reason because never get high on your own supply. Don't smoke your own weed, right? So if the red blood cell had a mitochondria, it would eat up all that oxygen before it gets to anything, anywhere else in the body. So they only do glycolysis. And they make pyruvate. 
and then they're able to turn the pyruvate into lactate, blah, 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 do whatever, do whatever else they want, right? But one more thing they have is a special enzyme. And that enzyme is called bisphosphoglycerate mutase. And bisphosphoglycerate mutase will take 1,3-BPG One three BPG, and it will turn it into two three BPG. All right. So all we need to know is that bisphosphoglycerate mutase does that. All right? And in your, in your body, you have a protein that is carried by red blood cells. That protein is called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin, if nothing were attached to it, has a curve. Don't copy this down. If nothing were attached to it, has a oxygen dissociation curve that looks like this. It holds on to oxygen all the time, like almost all the time. Even like your muscles are over here, and it's still holding on to 100% of its oxygen. Sarah, what evolutionary pathway have we made in red blood cells to increase the offloading of oxygen? Offloading Not just that. What did we talk about before? So this is adult hemoglobin. And adult hemoglobin binds 2,3-BPG. And that binding of 2,3-BPG conformationally changes the hemoglobin in order to increase offloading into the rest of the body. So 2,3-BPG decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And that sounds like a bad thing. That sounds like a bad thing until you realize that now the curve looks a little more like this. So now, when you're at the level of the muscles at rest, you're offloading a lot of oxygen. And when the muscles are exercising, you're offloading even more oxygen, right? And when you can't breathe, you're offloading a lot of oxygen, like so much oxygen. But if you weren't attached to 2,3-BPG, do you see how you wouldn't get enough oxygen out into the muscles? Because the offloading's not happening? So that's HBA. And this curve is? This curve right here is HBA plus 2,3 BPG. Right shift. It offloads more. You know what form of hemoglobin doesn't attach to 2,3 BPG? Hmm? What form of hemoglobin doesn't bind 2,3-BPG? Fetal. fetal hemoglobin. So fetal hemoglobin has a curve that looks more like this, right? And why is that? Well, the fetal lung doesn't work. The fetal lung doesn't work yet. So it gets blood from the mother. How? Well, inside the fetus, when blood returns from the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, we want to shunt it past the lungs, right? 
So what happens is that the right atrium and the left atrium of the fetus are connected via the foramen ovale, which allows blood to flow over the foramen ovale and into the left atrium, bypassing the right ventricle. Some of the blood that gets into the right ventricle is pumped out through the pulmonary artery, right? And the pulmonary artery is connected to the aorta via the ductus arteriosus, right? And that blood flows over into the aorta and to the rest of the body. The blood that did enter the left atrium goes in the left ventricle and out the aorta. Now, the blood that's in the aorta goes all throughout the body until it reaches the venous circulation down here. And some of the blood is picked up by the umbilical vein. And the, oh, sorry, the umbilical artery, my bad. The umbilical artery will pick up some of that blood, bring it towards the placenta, oxygenate it, and put it back into the fetus through the umbilical vein. That the umbilical vein is one of the veins that carries oxygenated blood, right? So that oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein gets mixed in with the deoxygenated blood inside of the inferior vena cava of the fetus, and the whole cycle repeats. And since there's mixed oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, you want to make sure that when it encounters oxygen, it holds on to as much of it as possible. And when it encounters a very low oxygen environment, it starts to unload that oxygen. Good? What does it know once it's going to ECG? That's a very good question. I asked that to Professor Molitsky as well. And it's honestly just like a physiologic phenomenon. Like as you get older, the gene expression changes. So the, the genes for HBF get turned off, and the genes for HBA get turned on. It's like an environmental sort of physiologic gene expression thing. Ask God. OK, so that was a little overview of fetal circulation once again, because I love to go back on that stuff. Um, and then this is not really HBA, because that's actually HBA, because it will always bind to the VBG. This is HBF. And also myoglobin, right? Except myoglobin is not going to have that slope at the beginning. It's just going to be like straight up. Right, right, right. Why don't we offload all of our oxygen all the time? I love to talk about this stuff. It's me specifically. I love to talk about it. Because too much oxygen is poisonous. And it'll make reactive oxygen species. Remember we talked about that? How oxygen can turn into like hydroxide radicals and superoxides and things like that? That's why we don't offload all of our oxygen all the time. Hmm? Well, the red blood cells can hold on to a lot of it. Yeah. So I'm wondering like why are the cells? Well, be because the um, the red blood cells are going to die anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Like they don't have they don't have nuclei, or do they have? No, no. They, sorry, they don't have mitochondria, right? I don't think they have nuclei either, right? No. They they just exist, right? So there's nothing to really damage there. They don't really have DNA. They don't have anything like that. So they're holding on to oxygen. If they get damaged, they just die and they get recycled. Where do red blood cells get recycled? The spleen. It is the graveyard of red blood cells. Right, right, right. OK. Very long, exhausting conversation about glycolysis. Let's talk about how other sugars get into the glycolytic pathway. Also. Let's add to the chart right here, wherever we can. So this is activated by F26BP and AMP. And this is inhibited by ATP and citrate. And this is activated by fructose 2,6-base phosphate. And this can go one of two ways, which we're going to talk about later. This can turn into acetyl-CoA, or it can turn into uh, lactate. But for the, um, for the discussion we're having right now, let's turn into acetyl-CoA. So this is going to go I'm going to draw a line here, because this isn't really glycolysis. We'll talk about it anyways. And we will use ADP. PI, NAD, um, CoASH, and we will make 
ATP, NADH, plus H plus, CO2, and acetyl-CoA. I think another cofactor there, you don't have to write it down, but I won't write it down because it's not important, but another cofactor there is TPP, thiamine pyrophosphate, thiamine being B1, vitamin B1. And the reason I know that is because Professor Malitsky taught me that whenever you're doing alpha decarboxylations, we know how beta decarboxylations work. We saw that in orgo, where it just happens spontaneously. Alpha decarboxylations in the body require TPP. And if you see here, this is the carboxyl group that goes away. This, sorry, this is the carboxyl group that goes away right here. And that is what? That is alpha to a ketone. So if it's alpha to a ketone, that's going to go away. It needs TPP, thiamine pyrophosphate. You're going to see that come up again when we go to the citric acid cycle. Let's talk about the lactose. So if you are one of the lucky people who can still metabolize lactose properly, you may form some galactose in your body. And it is phosphorylated by galactose, or sorry, galactokinase, galactokinase into galactose 1-phosphate. How do you draw galactose again? It is the C4 epimer of glucose. Take glucose and flip the C4OH. Do you want me to draw it? So, two, three, four. That is galactose. Throw phosphate on that oxygen at the bottom instead of the hydrogen. That's going to be galactose 1-phosphate. And this, in several steps, gets turned into glucose 1 phosphate. Those steps include galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase and an epimerase. What's an epimerase? It makes the epimer, the epimer. So it turns lactose into glucose, C4 epimerase. Huh? Galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, U-R-I-D-Y-L transferase. What does U-R-I stand for? in medicine, mm -hmm. upper respiratory infection. <laughs> Urinary tract infection. One of my favorite drinks is cranberry juice. And whenever I drink it, my friends are just like, do you have a UTI? And I was like, how the fuck? No. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Cranberries are good for UTIs. It's, it's so funny because, like, all my friends know I'm Muslim. So it's like, dude, like, premarital sex is a no. How am I going to get a UTI? <laughs> Unless I, like, hold in my piss for seven days straight. I don't think it's going to happen. That can give you a UTI. Yeah. If you hold in for long enough, yeah. Oh, it's painful. It, it's going to be incredibly painful, giving yourself a UTI. <laughs> but another way you could get is, uh, like, kidney stones. If you have, like, a super, super, super high-protein diet 
or if you have like some sort of kidney abnormality that causes acidity or basicity in your urine, you can precipitate out a kidney stone and infection can form around the stone. Or you could be stupid. I won't elaborate on that one on camera. <laughs> Make sure your partner's clean. <laughs> It's not what I mean by clean. <laughs> Probably because uh, the diaper hosts a bunch of bacteria. All right, so that's galactose metabolism, right? Let's talk about fructose metabolism, because it's interesting. So fructose, fructose, our guy fructose, which you just swap the aldehyde and glucose with the closest OH to it, right? It's fructose, right? The liver phosphorylates fructose into fructose 1-phosphate, right? And I think that's called fructokinase. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, it is, because there's two diseases associated with fructose metabolism that you don't need to know about, but fructokinase. And that's going to make fructose 1-phosphate. It's fructose 1-phosphate. So normally we're used to seeing fructose 6-phosphate getting turned into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, right? But here that's not the case. Fructose by itself gets turned into fructose 1-phosphate in the liver using fructokinase, right? And then that fructokinase is actually, sorry, that fructose 1-phosphate is actually acted upon by a very interesting enzyme. Does anyone know the enzyme? Probably not. You don't really encounter it until like the MCAT or medical school. I don't even think like biochem talks about it all that much. It's called, what was the enzyme we looked at before that went two ways? It's called aldolase, right? This one is called aldolase B. Aldolase B. Could you imagine your parents naming you that way? It's like, all right, this one's Yusuf and that one's Yusuf B. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny because um, both my sisters have names that start with S, and I just came out of nowhere and I was like, nope, not happening. But it's because my mom wanted to name me after her dad, so that's what happened. Aldolase B is an aldolase, so it does a retroaldol reaction with this, so we can kind of figure out what's going to happen. Because look, look at the retroaldol we did before. It just cut it right down the middle, and then wherever it cut, it turned the bottom position into a aldehyde, right? Because that's what retroaldols do. So we're going to cut here and turn this into an aldehyde. So if we do that, we're going to make dhap, and not gap, because we don't have that second phosphate on there. We're just going to make glyceraldehyde. And eventually that glyceraldehyde can feed into glycolysis by getting phosphorylated and moving forward and blah, 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 blah. OK? Yes? Also, DHAP can be used for triglyceride synthesis as well. And that ends our discussion on glycolysis. Sorry, what was that called? The last one? Uh, glyceraldehyde. Oh, yeah, no P. No P? You're going to get a UTI. 
<laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That ends our discussion on glycolysis. Who's happy? I'm not happy. I'm tired. <laughs> no, I'm pretty happy. That was good. Honestly, that was pretty good timing. An hour and a half is roughly about how long I thought it would take. Huh? We are halfway through chapter nine. <laughs> no, we're going to keep going. <laughs> no breaks today, sorry. <laughs> this is going to be like a two and a half hour lecture. Throw, throw back to chapter one of what is a cell? Isn't that the first question I asked you guys? What is a cell? Uh, how far does this go? Hold on. Actually, actually, yeah, I think we only need two parts for this because now we do, we do pyruvate dehydrogenase and then we do glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. And then we do glu oh fuck. Never mind. <laughs> then we do gluconeogenesis. And then we do the pentose phosphate pathway. And then we're done with chapter nine. And then chapter ten is acetyl CoA, and then fatty acid oxidation, and then the TCA cycle, and then uh, specifics of the TCA cycle, and <laughs> then ATP yield, <laughs> and then the electron transport chain. And then every single complex in the electron transport chain. And then the malate aspartate shuttle. And then oxidative phosphorylation. And then we're done with chapter 10. So. Why should we die? <laughs> <laughs> Ask God. <laughs> All right, let's do pyruvate dehydrogenase. So, the, are you guys getting tired of looking at that, or should I keep that up there? I'm going to leave it up for like the next person who comes in here. Yeah. <laughs> They're running and be like, holy shit. <laughs> I run straight out. <laughs> Tuesday, Thursday, 6 to 9 p.m. <laughs> All right. So glycolysis, at the end of the day, produces this molecule that you should get used to drawing out. And it's pyruvate. And assuming that you're a healthy person at rest, that pyruvate is going to move forward and encounter a complex called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, abbreviated as PDH. And this occurs inside the mitochondria. So pyruvate slips through the cracks and gets into the mitochondria through a transporter, right? Because it's polar. It's not going to get in through the phospholipid bilayer. It can't slip through. It's charged, right? So it's going to enter through a channel, right? And it's going to encounter the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex inside the mitochondria. And as we said before, hmm. hold on. I feel like they're missing something in the book. They are. No. I, mm, mm. They're kind of missing something in the book. Let me, hold on. Yeah, because they don't really say in this diagram, if you look at my notes, I'm going to fix the diagram before we do it. Because in the diagram, they say that gl glucose makes pyruvate, and then pyruvate makes NADH, releases CO2, uses CoA, blah, blah, blah. But they don't say that there's an ATP made. But if you look in a medical textbook, they do say that there is an uh, there is. I'm pretty sure there's ATP made somewhere. You know what, let me get back to you on that. I might need to make a correction in this lecture, but I'm pretty sure there's ATP made here. But the way the book shows it, 
is that you have an AD. You make an ID H, H plus, and you put in CoA SH, which is just coenzyme A, and you release a CO2. And you get acetyl CoA. Ugh, now this is going to bother me. Nope, you do make ATP. Yeah, I have to do more research on that, but let me make sure. So I'm going to put ATP question mark, <laughs> like here. We'll look at it later. OK, so you make acetyl-CoA. And that acetyl-CoA can go into where? The TCA cycle, right? And the thing about the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the reason it's called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is because it's actually multiple enzymes that all function together and work synergistically in order to make acetyl-CoA, right? And that's it. They don't tell you anything else about this because the next thing is that acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle. But before they tell you about the citric acid cycle, they want to tell you other ways that we get here, one of them being glycogenolysis. So let's say that you are Muslim and or Jewish, right? And you are fasting. You are fasting, right? And while you're fasting, you hit about eight hours since your last meal, and now your body has naturally burned through all of the free glucose that you have inside your bloodstream, right, and all, all your cells and everything. You have to continue producing glucose for your body to function, right? You have to continue producing energy. So, actually, sorry, not eight hours. It's been a, like a couple hours. Eight hours is when you burn through glycogen. Um, so you have to begin using another store of Glucose, what is that store of glucose in our body? Glycogen, liver glycogen. So let's talk about glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. So when we eat a very large meal, right, the insulin is going to act to allow some of the glucose to be uptaken into the cells, but it's also going to allow for some of the glucose to go towards the synthesis of this molecule, glycogen, right? And glycogen is synthesized through a process known as glycogenesis. Glycogenesis. So glycogenesis is the synthesis of glycogen granules, and it begins with a core protein called glycogenin. So this is our core protein, and this protein is called glycogenin. Right? Glycogenesis has a rate limiting enzyme. And that rate limiting enzyme is known as glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase. And glycogen synthase creates alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkages alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkages
the way this begins is that glucose 6 phosphate is turned into glucose 1 phosphate. And then this glucose 1 phosphate is actually activated by, I think it's UTP or UDP? Yeah, UTP. UTP, and you throw away a pyrophosphate. So two pho the two phosphates bound together. And you make UDP glucose. And that UDP glucose can be added onto the chain. So that's the activation of glucose for glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis. And the addition onto the chain is done by glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase is activated by G6P and insulin, which makes perfect sense. It is inhibited by a very interesting thing. Well, first of all, glucagon, because insulin, right? I don't know what else inhibits glycogen synthase. Epinephrine. Why does that make sense? Not just that, but epinephrine is indicated in what pathway? The fight or flight response, right? 